Good evening, everyone. My name is Ware Harmon, and I'm the Executive Director of Town Hall Seattle. On behalf of our staff and our friends at Third Place Books, it's a pleasure to welcome you to our presentation of David K. Johnston in conversation with Sarah Reineveld. As we get underway, I want to acknowledge that our institution stands on the unceded traditional territory of the Coast Salish people, and particularly the Duwamish. We thank them for our continuing use of the natural resources of their ancestral homeland. And we are very glad you're here with us for tonight's virtual presentation, which should run around 60 minutes, including Q&A. To pose your own question, please enter meet.ps forward slash Johnston or scan the QR code right now on the screen with your smartphone. We'll also drop this link in the chat and you can submit yours whenever the mood strikes. We can't guarantee we'll be able to address everyone, but we will try to get to as many as possible. And you can do your part by keeping your own question concise. And as we like to say when we're all gathered together in the building, in the form of a question. If you want to enable closed captioning, meanwhile, on your uh, at-home device, click the CC button in the bottom right corner of your video player. Town Hall is adding new events and podcasts every day. Tomorrow evening, Bill Radke returns to Town Hall for KUOW's annual, as you might imagine, year in review, a kind of macro edition of the station's popular Friday roundup, cleverly entitled The Week in Review. The rest of December holds an array of events from our, our, our very fine rental partners, including KNKX's Holiday Jam, Earshot Jazz's annual presentation of the terrific Duke Ellington Sacred Music Concert featuring the Seattle Repertory Jazz Orchestra, and plenty of other concerts to keep you in a festive mood or to jumpstart one if you're just not there yet. Visit our website to join our email list and for updates throughout the season. Town Hall's work is made possible through your support and the support of our sponsors. Our Civic Series is supported by the Real Networks Foundation and the True Brown Foundation. But as you must know by now, if you've attended previous Town Hall events, Town Hall is member supported at its heart. And I'd like to thank all of our members joining us tonight. If you're not yet a member and you share Town Hall's vision of a community that's strengthened by discussions about civics, science, and culture, please consider joining yourself. Or if you're looking for a gift for that hard to please friend or loved one, our memberships work wonders there too. And one final bit of infomercial, I promise. Tonight's conversation is sure to reignite that low simmering you, you likely began to feel from the moment a certain someone stepped onto that fateful gilded escalator. And I'll tell you, the best way to crank it up to a full boil is to purchase your own copy of David K. Johnston's latest book. The link in the chat below will take you to our friends at Third Place Books, and that way you'll keep your purchases local amid this very shoppy time of the year. And with all of that, David K. Johnston is no stranger to Town Hall, and yet, near as we can tell, he's never darkened the door of the building. How can this be? Well, his last appearance was during our 2018 Inside Out season, when 200 folks joined us at the summit on Pike Street, uh, maybe you were among them, for a program that has gone on to over 2 million views on YouTube. And this year, somehow he's still managing to dodge our Great Hall Green Room, opting instead for our digital stage. In any event, uh, a winner of the 2001 Pulitzer Prize for Beat Reporting and the co-founder and editor of DCReport.com, David has been called one of America's most important journalists by the Washington Monthly and has acted as an uncredited source of documents and insight for major campaign reports by the Washington Post, New York Times, Bloomberg, and Network Television. From July 2011 to, until September 2012, he was a columnist for Reuters, offering commentaries on global issues of tax, accounting, economics, public finance, and business. Uh, Johnston is the board president of investigative reporters and editors. He's also written for Al Jazeera English in America. You also likely know him uh, as one of the country's most dogged and thorough chroniclers of Donald Trump's conduct with featured appearances in two of his seven previous books, Temples of Chance from way back in 1992 and the New York Times bestsellers, The Making of Donald Trump and It's Even Worse Than You Think from 2018. Sarah Reineveld is an attorney, community advocate, union member, and a parent. She currently serves as the Managing Assistant Attorney General, uh, that's AAG, in the Washington Attorney General's uh, Office's Environmental Division. Previously, she served for nine years as an AAG representing the Department of Labor and Industries. Uh, Sarah is a proud 15-year state employee with other stints in the Governor's Office, the Washington State Senate, and the University of Washington. Uh, Johnston's latest book, The Big Cheat, how Donald Trump fleeced America and enriched himself and his family is the subject of this evening's talk. Please join me in welcome Sarah, welcoming Sarah Reineveld and David K. Johnston. Thank you so much. Uh, again, my name is Sarah and I'm honored and excited to be joined this evening by reporter David K. Johnston to discuss his new book, The Big Cheat. So thank you for joining us this evening for this important and timely discussion about our democracy. 
David, this book is brilliant. You know, I thought I knew a lot about the Trump administration, but I realized that what I had been tracking in the news during the Trump presidency really just scratched the surface. And it was so much more than what I thought. Um, you know, to me, this book is important because it really builds the case against Donald Trump, showing us in simple terms how he used the power of the most powerful elected position in the world, the US presidency, um, you know, to, to turn the White House into a money-making enterprise for himself and his family. And while the book is so compelling and so interesting, it's also really concerning and enraging because it shows us, you know, how profoundly Trump scammed and took advantage of Americans, many of the most vulnerable Americans. So as has been pointed out before, you're not new to the subject of Donald Trump and have written extensively on Trump's conduct in other books. Why did you write The Big Cheat? And what do you want this audience to take away from it? Well, The Big Cheat makes for a trilogy. Uh, my second, I did an earlier one where Town Hall graciously had me out about the economy, perfectly legal on taxes, free lunch on subsidies and the fine print on monopolies. And in this case, uh, I did a biography of Donald Trump before the voting in 2016 so that people would know such things as uh, he's had two income tax fraud trials, civil, not criminal, but fraud trials, and he lost them, that he had done extraordinary favors over a long period of time for one of the biggest drug lords in America, to the point where I think the evidence is clear that he was in the cocaine trafficking business with this guy. He just didn't handle any of the drugs. Um, and then I wrote, uh, it's even worse than you think, one year into his term to show what they were doing to our government. And I will give the Trump people credit. They ran for office saying, in the words of Steve Bannon, that we're going to destroy the uh, administrative state. We're going to deconstruct the administrative state, which is fancy language for we're going to ruin the federal government. And they were doing a very, very good job. at it. In this case, there, were, there are a lot of books out there about Donald Trump, and many of them are Washington White House reporter insider books. But what no one had done was pulled together all the loose threads of stories that were broken in Politico, the New York Times, the AP, uh, the Seattle Times, that uh, were little loose threads about how the Trump family, the Kushner family, and some of Trump's cronies were monetizing the White House. And in putting the book together, uh, one of my eight children does a lot of research for me. She kept bringing me things and I would go, I remember reading that, but I didn't think it was important at the time. Or, wow, how did we miss that one? And my daughter, Amy, is very good at, at spotting and connecting things like that. And what I wanted to do was weave all these loose threads. She wouldn't have seen all of them unless you read 10 newspapers a day and put them into a tapestry and a narrative so you could understand what they were doing. And as with all my books, I write them uh, in a way that if you finished high school, you should be able to understand <laughs> everything in the books. That's one of the things I worked very hard to do is take these complex concepts and turn them into plain English without doing violence to them. So you kind of start the book uh, with telling the story of how Trump was elected, right? And, and the promises that he made and then broke to the American people. And, you know, you, you talked a little bit about, you know, what a scam artist he was. And I think, you know, the story of how Trump was elected is so important, particularly to this audience in Seattle, because I think many of us, including myself, thought that Trump was unelectable, right? Um, you know, he was a failed businessman, this kind of ridiculous TV personality, a scam artist, um, and that he was grossly unqualified for public office. Um, but that being said, you know, in the book, you lay out um, that there were many Americans, um, many working class Americans that really had a much more rosy view of Trump. And in your, your book, you state, and I quote, um, that those Americans viewed Trump, quote, as a hero, a larger than life business giant who could turn anything into gold while thumbing his nose at American aristocracy. So, you know, how in the book do you talk about 
um, how Trump created this image of himself during the campaign and kind of why so many Americans, particularly working class Americans, believed him. Well, Donald is the greatest con artist in the history of the world. He conned his way into the White House, a job for which he has no qualifications whatsoever. <clears throat> and uh, the reason he was able to do this is his masterful skill at telling people he's doing something for them while doing the exact opposite. Mm -hmm. Donald is the third generation head of a four generation white collar crime family. His grandfather uh, emigrated from Germany in 1885 so he could escape the German draft under Bismarck. He came to Seattle. He ran a restaurant and behind a curtain there were what are known in the days as sporting ladies available. Uh, he later went to Everett, Washington and did the same thing and to the Yukon Territory. In fact, at one point he built a hotel on land he didn't own, not for sleeping, at least not in the uh, nocturnal sense. And uh, th this is the beginning of the Trump crime family. Of course, nothing happened to him back then, except that when he tried to return to Germany, the Germans wrote him a letter. I have a copy of saying, get the hell out of our country, you traitor, no good. <laughs> good uh, for Donald's, them. <laughs> Donald's, and, and then he died during the pandemic uh, of a century ago. Uh, Donald's father, Fred Trump, uh, was a very hardworking, ambitious guy. And as a teenager, he had a business in his mother's name. Uh, building garages in the outer boroughs of New York for these newfangled automobiles that were becoming quite popular. And if you think about it, it's not that difficult to build garages. You don't have to do plumbing and wiring. You just have to throw up a wooden structure, maybe with a window and a big door for the car to go in and out. Uh, his father went on to rip off the government in housing for returning GIs and sailors after World War II basically took close to $40 million in today's money um, and got away with it. And Donald, as soon as he uh, was given a degree he did not earn at Penn in economics, came to New York, made a beeline for the notorious Roy Cohn, the lawyer for the McCarthy hearings, and later all sorts of mobsters and celebrities. And he learned from Roy Cohn valuable lessons. The first and most important was if law enforcement comes after you, they're corrupt, they're dishonest, they have no reason to do this, don't trust anything they say. The second lesson was deny, no matter how obvious it is that you did something, you never concede and you never see Donald Trump concede. Mm -hmm. The third was delay, 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 as we saw when Donald Trump twice went to the U.S. Supreme Court trying to prevent the release of accounting records from his accounting firm in what is basically a garden variety uh, investigation by the Ma Manhattan uh, uh, Grand Jury and District Attorney. As a candidate, uh, Sarah, Donald started off with what I call lie one. Mm -hmm. uh, the day of his announcement, and Donald's been talking since 1987, roughly, saying, I should be president. No one else is competent to be president. I'm the only one who should ever hold the job. He makes this announcement at Trump Tower, and he starts off with this racist attack on Mexican, the Mexican government is sending rapists and murderers here to wild applause. He is interrupted 43 times in this applause and clapping. And I'm watching this on TV from my home here in Rochester, New York. And I go, wait a minute, this is Midtown Manhattan. Where did he get these people? You know, a, a clan okay. rat in West Virginia. Well, they were paid actors. They got 50 bucks each to show up and applaud on cue. So Donald says thousands of people there. Well, anybody who's been inside the Trump Tower lobby knows you couldn't put thousands of people there. And then he makes this lie, but you know what? It took hold. The New York Times, right. where I was a reporter for many years, didn't even quote his lines the next day, said nothing about the lie. We found that out from, of all places, The Hollywood Reporter, a trade publication in Los Angeles. And that's how he got the campaign going. Now, there's a second part to your question, and that is, why does he have all this support among blue collar workers, uh, et cetera? 90% of Americans had a smaller income in 2018 Mm -hmm. than 45 years earlier in 1973. I mean, obviously I'm adjusting for inflation. Right. Their, the re incomes they reported were smaller. 
the health plans that if they uh, had it back in 73 or their parents did were entirely on top of their wages are now taken out of their wages plus co-pays. Right. Um, they're in more in debt, much, much more in debt. Uh, everyone's job is tenuous in America. I mean, we've seen tenured professors and school teachers fired. So tenure doesn't mean anything anymore. And that's a major factor. And then Donald secondly was blatantly appealing to people who hate the civil rights movement, people who they don't want an Asian sitting next to him in the airplane. They don't want to have a Latino as captain and God forbid they have to go and report to a black woman boss. Thirdly are the evangelicals and all these pastors who endorsed Donald Trump, even though in one of his books, Think Big, Donald spends six pages denigrating and denouncing Christians as fools, idiots, and schmucks. And he has declared innumerable times, including when he was president, that his philosophy of life is one word, one word that is aggressively anti-Christian and can't be reconciled with his claim to be a Christian. That is revenge. That's his life philosophy, revenge by his own account. So all of these things gave Donald appeal to people who feel the government hasn't done anything for me. The government's worked against my interests. Why am I seeing all these people get rich when I play by the rules? I go to work every day. I take care of my family. Uh, I take care of my children. Uh, why am I in, not in such good straits? And Donald said, oh, it's, it's not your fault. And I will take care of it. I alone can solve this. And people believed him. So, you know, you, you point out that Trump's presidency was kind of started or started with this lie, right? And then he kind of motivated a lot of folks that are bigoted and racist and kind of othered uh, people. And so he's, he was kind of growing momentum in, in that way. Um, but in the book, you chronicle in this really brilliant way, kind of the specific promises that Trump made on the campaign trail um, to these people that, you know, many of them, like you, you, you said, were in debt, struggling to make ends meet, working Americans who believed that the American dream had left them behind. So, you know, what specific, specific promises um, did you chronicle kind of in your book did Trump make um, around job creation, tax reduction, even kind of lowering the price of prescription drugs? And how did he break these promises and ultimately betray the American people? I mean, it's even worse than what we thought. Yeah, it's even worse than you think, as we said. Right. Well, uh, Donald said he would have 6% gross domestic product growth. The economy would grow 6%. Uh, he started out at three in 2017, he went down to a little over two, and then he went to a little under two, and then of course he went negative. So each year he was in office, it got worse. Um, he claimed at one point that uh, Ivanka, his daughter, had created 14 million jobs. And then he came back and said 15 million jobs, which was astonishing because there weren't that many jobs created, nonetheless being the result of her work. Uh, he claimed I think credit. you point out in your book that they were actually ProPublica said there were 797 jobs that were actually right. in the whole country there were fewer than 800 <laughs> jobs that they could trace to Donald Trump's actions and they put a lot of time and effort into that into that story he claimed credit for um, uh, Ford Motor Company investments that were publicly announced before he uh, won the Electoral College in 2016 for routine capital investments by Exxon Mobil uh, mm -hmm. that were announced ahead of time. And this is what Donald does. I mean, he, he, Donald in his own mind, if he says something, then that makes it true. And even if he contradicts himself 90 seconds later, no, 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 I didn't contradict myself. What are you talking about? He creates his own reality. So none of these things happen. Remember, he said the first thing he would do when he got to Washington was an infrastructure bill. And boy, if there's anything right. this country needs, it's infrastructure work never introduced a bill. Joe Biden introduced a bill and it took a while, but it's now law, um, uh, something Trump never did. He said, we're gonna lower drug prices. And during the 2020 campaign, he particularly emphasized, we're going to lower drug prices. He never did anything that lowered drug prices, nothing. Now it isn't in the book because it happened after we closed the book, but you know he claims credit for the mRNA vaccines like Pfizer. Mm -hmm. uh, David Heath, who many people listening may recall, was an excellent Seattle Times reporter, has mm -hmm. a book coming out next month 
uh, about how, no, Trump had nothing to do with it. The scientific advances that allowed these vaccines began a number of years ago, and Pfizer, the most widely used vaccine, didn't take any government money. It had nothing to do with warp speed. They did it all on their own. So it, it, Donald makes promises, doesn't deliver. And when I talk to Trump people, today I've talked to several of them, call in radio and things like that. They insist he really did all these things. Um, there's a, a new poll that shows that 17% of the random sample of Americans who were surveyed believe the Republicans are the reason the infrastructure bill is here and that they're getting, uh, depending on age of the child, 250 or $300 a month from the government for their minor children. These were things the Republicans fought against and not one of them voted for, but they get credit for it. Uh, so uh, basically, you know, if Donald tells you he's gonna do something for you, the forgotten men and women of America, every decision right. with you in mind, just figure that's the opposite of what he's going to do and you'll probably hit the nail on the head. <laughs> So before we leave this topic of kind of Donald's uh, failed promises to the American public, um, one thing stood out in your book, and that was, um, you know, the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act and Trump's promises around how he was going to lower taxes for particularly working class Americans, but for everyone. And then, you know, he enacts this tax proposal that's basically an unprecedented transfer of wealth. Um, you know, and, and a huge tax cut to our richest Americans and the largest corporations. And, you know, you talk about in your book, for example, what, how much Apple benefited, um, you know, from this, this huge kind of unprecedented tax break. And I just wanted to, to read something and then, you know, have you comment on it. So, Trump's tax law, you say, forgave 50 billion of Apple's obligations, roughly the same amount paid each year in total income taxes by American households with pre-tax income of less than 800 per year. You combine that with nearly 7 billion of investment earnings and the interest-free loans that Trump gave Apple, and the company gained 120 billion from that tax cut. That giant 120 billion tax cut, tax favor to Apple equals all the income taxes paid by the poorest 71 million American income tax filers for more than two years. So this was- that's, 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 two, that's uh, 71 million is half the income tax payers. So Apple got a bigger benefit than what's paid by the bottom half of Americans for two years. Well, <clears throat> this is not what Donald promised. No. Donald, on the day he announced, said a married couple will get $50,000 a year before they owe any income taxes. And a number of the lines Donald used about economics and finance, he got from me. Uh, they're almost word for word from the speeches and lectures and TV appearances. And I've had people who know us both call me and say, Donald asked me about such and such. What exactly did you say? And, and he, so he picked up on many of my themes. So he said, we're going to go to 25000 a person, 50000 a couple before you own the income taxes. The law at the time was about $21,300, the exact numbers in the book. When mm -hmm. Donald's law was passed, it was raised to about $22,000, bupkis. But if you're at the top, you got a huge gain. Uh, Corporations got a 40% cut in their tax rate. Com companies with money overseas either were allowed to escape 85% of the taxes they had deferred by sending profits overseas, or in some cases, more than 90%. There were some little technical wrinkles in the law. Uh, and then they were given eight years to pay this off, which is what I call the eight-year zero interest loans. That's where Apple gets $70 billion dollars because that's the investment value of those loans. And ordinary people, they get almost nothing. And this wasn't a tax cut. Right. There was no public hearing held about it. It's all borrowed money. And if you finance a tax cut with borrowed money, all you're really doing is pushing the tax burden into the future with interest. Right. And Donald personally said, I'll pay more taxes. No, he got a 40% tax cut for himself in this deal too, roughly 40%. So he robbed the very Americans that he claimed he was trying to help and represent. I will um, tell you, Sarah, trying to get people who have a blue collar job, who pay someone to fill out their uh, 1040 easy tax form, a one page tax form, 
trying to get them to understand that, no, they took money from you and gave it to billionaires. Well, I don't know. They're all rich. I don't understand any of it. And, and that's how he benefits from that. People don't, even though taxes are the biggest expenditure in the country, uh, people don't want to think about taxes. If, 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 a, uh, if a cosmonaut from another planet or an astronaut came here and had to file a report on the economy of the planet Earth, They'd start off by saying human beings spend 40% of their resources on taxes and you would think they really love them, but no, they hate them except for those who get richer off the taxes and they're the already richest people. So um, thank you for that. Um, I, I wanna shift gears here and, and just talk about the ways uh, that you outline in the book in which Trump really turned the White House into a money-making machine. And he skirted and oftentimes broke the law to directly enrich and benefit himself and his family. Um, so one of the most brilliant things that I really appreciated about the book, particularly as an attorney, um, is it that it really makes that case in detail for how Trump broke the law by illegally profiting off his own businesses, how he used the power of his presidency for his own personal gain. Um, and it really breaks down the conflicts of interest, the misuse of government funds, and kind of the gross illegal profiteering that he engaged us. So kind of walk us through that, if, if you know, if you will, kind of what are some of the examples you point to um, in the book that, that are important to highlight? Well, less, Sarah, less than an hour before Donald Trump, less than an hour after Donald Trump took the oath of office on his way to the White House, he had his motorcade stop on Constitution Avenue. The family got out, they took a two minute turn on the pavement. None of the TV networks, none of the newspaper reports pointed out where he did that. He did it in front of the Trump Hotel, which was right. uh, his lease of a government building known as the old post office. But every, I assure you, every lobbyist, every favor seeker, every foreign government official, they knew exactly, as I did, where he had stopped, and they got the message. If you want a favor from the Trump administration, you will pay tribute to Donald. And people right. paid tribute like crazy. They paid top rates for rooms uh, there at the, the, the Doral Country Club and other places that Trump owns. The Saudis took out whole floors of his hotel. By the way, the lease for the hotel said no government employee can be involved. It traces back to law to 1808. The bureaucrats, and I have a whole chapter about this, it's, it's a farcical uh, chapter. They found ways to not uh, enforce the law by going, what, what, I don't see, what are you talking about? There's nothing to see here. Uh, they were willfully blind. Uh, Jared Kushner, the son-in-law who worked in the White House uh, and his wife, uh, Ivanka, had to file disclosure forms. They don't even match up on their jointly owned properties. They were, they were that sloppy. Jared was in deep financial trouble along with the rest of his family because they had bought 666 Fifth Avenue in Manhattan and wildly overpaid for it. So Jared went before Donald took office to the Qataris. Qatar is where we have our most important military base in the Middle mm -hmm. East. He asked them for $800 million in a loan. And they said, basically, uh, Jared, we're rich, but we're not stupid. We're not loaning you the money. Well, Donald Trump as president then turns on Qatar. He attacks them publicly. He takes the side of the Saudis and the Emiratis who are enemies of Qatar. And guess what? Jared Kushner's family gets bailed out by the Saudis and the Emiratis. And right now, Jared Kushner is raising money from the Saudis and the Emiratis for his new business, managing Middle East money here in the United States. Uh, the Kushners got uh, a series of 18 sweetheart mortgages guaranteed by the government. And while the government says, oh no, these were normal routine, I've read the paperwork, I'm sorry, no. You and I, even if we were very successful multimillionaire developers would never have been given loans on the terms the Kushners got. And, and Donald was so determined to uh, get money. Uh, Secret Service agents stayed at his hotels for his security. They paid the maximum rate. You know, you look on the back door of a hotel, it says $99, you paid, but the maximum room rate's 500. He was charging the 500. And our emoluments clause says that the president right. may not receive any compensation, that's what emoluments basically means, from foreign powers, or the states. And of course, the city of Seattle is a creature of the state of Washington. 
Well, lots of states and local police and other agencies spent money at his hotels right. for his security and other reasons. Clear violation of the Emoluments Clause. What happened with the federal judges who presented these cases? Uh, I don't want to deal with that. And they would just put it in a drawer. And eventually the Supreme Court said, well, Trump's out of office. So the whole matter is moot. And I, I'm not a lawyer, but I taught law for many years at Syracuse University in the law school there. And I assure you, this will be a subject of some significant discussion in the spring semester. The uh, failure to enforce the Emoluments Clause, the contracts, the rules, just across the board. Uh, it, 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 throughout the administration, that's what Donald did. He just maximized the money he could get from the government. He collected in his businesses more than $1.6 billion, including hundreds of millions from taxpayers. So, you know, I mean, it's just egregious and shocking to me, I think, that, you know, the courts never actually held him accountable for those particularly constitutional violations. But, you know, I think there's another theme here and that, you know, Trump didn't just enrich himself, right? But he also enriched his family in a way that was really unprecedented in American government. And, you know, he was able to use his family when convenient, um, you know, for example, saying he was transferring the ownership of his business, you know, to try to avoid conflicts of interest and then kind of in turn uh, use the American presidency and the connection with foreign leaders um, that came with the presidency to enrich his family. And, you know, for, for those of us that have worked in government from the outset, it was just kind of preposterous that, you know, Jared and Ivanka uh, could even have senior positions in his administration, particularly, you know, not just that they were unqualified, but that they had a number of personal relationships with foreign entities that should have been disqualifying and actually disqualified them from seeking kind of a high level security and obtaining a high level security clearance. So, you know, how, how were they able to obtain that clearance in the first place? And you know, what did particularly Ivanka and Jared do to enrich themselves? Um, and, you know, and, and what did that look like? Well, to see government secrets, you have to fill out a form called an SF-86. Mm -hmm. If you have to correct that form just once, you probably will be denied. But, you know, if you get by, a second correction absolutely guarantees you're out the door. Jared Kushner, again and again and again and again and again and again, had to modify his statement. You may recall that during the uh, 10 weeks between the election and the inauguration, Donald Trump Jr., uh, I'm sorry, it wasn't Donald, it was Jared. Jared Kushner went to the Russians and asked if he could use their secure communications in the Washington embassy to speak with Moscow. I can't think of a more disturbing act on their part, but then the Russians did something very smart from their perspective. Uh, they sent a cable describing all of this to the Kremlin, not on a fully secure channel, which means they wanted it to be seen. And a whole bunch of foreign governments who read that message put it out there uh, to reporters about what went on. Uh, this is an outrageous thing to do. And then we give this man access to high level secrets. And how did he get the clearance? Because the professional said, absolutely not. And Donald Trump said, I'm the president. He gets a security clearance. Right. And used it to heavily mine our records from the Middle East, where he's now setting himself up in business. Um, you have to understand that Donald, who's never done a day of public service in his life, doesn't see anything wrong with this. Donald has no concept like you and I do of right and wrong. All that matters is what he wants to do, and the rules don't apply to him. And the Kushners some of whom escaped the Holocaust by ignoring whatever the Nazis told them to do, they have the same philosophy because it worked for them. It kept them alive. Ignore the rules, do whatever you want to do. Not good for the country by any means. No, absolutely. I think one of the interesting things about the book is that throughout the book, you chronicle these numerous legal investigations and lawsuits 
uh, that were filed particularly by Democratic you know, state AGs. And as an attorney who works for a Democratic state uh, attorney general, I kept expecting the results of some of these lawsuits would be to kind of hold Trump accountable finally for his actions. And it seemed like there was a theme where you know, the vast majority of these lawsuits would disappear or they were settled or dismissed, or as you stated, Trump, you know, would just run the clock. So, you know, kind of stepping back, the book is entitled The Big Cheat, and it's clear that Trump is a monumental scam artist, but, you know, how was he able to weasel his way out of all these lawsuits? And is this just a failure of our legal system? Oh, it, that's exactly what it is. Uh, Donald is not unique. I have written about scam artists for more than 50 years among the various investigations I've done. Uh, Donald is just the best known person who does this in America. There's a career ladder for con artists. I've written about people who were junior players in their 20s, and I go back 10 or 15 years later, and they're at the mid-level and another 10 years, and they're the bosses of scams. Uh, there are FBI agents who've uh, uh, taught me about the career ladder for scam artists. America has very weak white collar crime laws. Our environmental laws are full of complexities that let people get off the hook. And at DC Report, we do a lot about this, particularly about um, uh, toxic sludge from right. uh, electric power plants, burning coal and other things. Now you're speaking my language. Yeah, no, I, I, I know this is your field. The, 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 uh, but I mean, it's a fundamental problem that our white collar crime laws are full of exceptions and vagaries, and they don't follow a simple principle. Fraud is everywhere and always a crime. And by assigning other people to do things, by saying, you know, you're the CEO, you, you speak through an assistant who speaks through an assistant who speaks through an executive, you then, if a criminal charge is brought, can say they misunderstood what I was telling them. Um, and Donald understands very well how to take advantage of this. He tears, when he was in business, he would tear up his calendars on the last day of each month. Uh, during his meeting with no other American president except a translator with Vladimir Putin, he took the uh, translator's notes and tore them up, which, as I read uh, Title 18, is a federal crime. Right. Um, he then went and met with Putin with no American in the room. My goodness, I, who knows what he said, but you can be sure the Russians have video and audio tape of that, and they've gone over it thoroughly. Um, we, so in the end of the book, uh, I do present a whole series of reforms we need. Yes. To do. Lots of people say we should make presidential candidates release their tax returns. We can't do that. The Constitution right. does not allow that. But there's an easy solution to that. Tax returns in this country used to be public. The only reason they're not public is Congress has in the, used its power to say they're not. Well, let's pass a law then that says uh, once you have won or come in second or third in one primary, the IRS will release your tax returns for at least six years. That would be very effective. And there's nothing to prohibit doing that under our laws whatsoever. And we need to fundamentally work on our white collar crime laws. One of the things I teach my students is if you bring a, a white collar crime charge against someone and it takes you six weeks or six months to, to lay out your case, I think you've been, by the very length of it, created reasonable doubt. Right. Cases shouldn't be that difficult. And, but the law makes them that difficult. And when you see Donald Trump indicted, by the way, as he will be by a grand jury in Manhattan, it won't be on a tax charge. There may be an underlying tax charge, but the charge is going to be a racketeering charge, Article 460 of the New York Penal Code, which is the New York State RICO statute, because people understand racketeering. Right. The tax charge, even though Donald has said, I am the greatest expert in the history of the world on taxes, no one knows more about taxes than I do, his lawyers would say, oh, that's just puffery. You know, of course right. he's not an expert on taxes. And that would help him get off. That's why you're not going to see a principal charge of tax evasion, even though Donald's a first class tax evader. And as I mentioned earlier, has had two civil trials for tax fraud, both of which he lost. In fact, yeah. he, forged, he forged his own tax return. His own lawyer testified that Donald Trump forged the return. 
It's just so egregious. And I think I speak for many on this call um, when I say I can't wait for that date when he is indicted. <laughs> um, but I want to thank you so much for just our part of this conversation. And we have some great questions in the chat and I'm gonna turn it over and, and try to get to as many of these questions as I can. So question one, is there any reason to think Trump might have a harder time taking advantage of the office for personal gain if he runs and wins again in 2024? Um, and I guess, what's your prediction on him running? Well, I think once he's indicted, that will change the whole picture. But if Donald were to get back into the White House, and if there were an election held today, I think he'd handily beat Joe Biden. Um, if he gets back into the White House, it's game over for democracy and our liberties in this country, because he will this time bring in people who will move to seize power much more effectively than he did at the end of his administration. And I had predicted in 2015 and said many times in many forums, Donald Trump gets in the White House, he will never leave peacefully, which is what happened. So he gets back in. Um, we're, 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 our liberties, our, exper our experiment is the world's oldest democracy. Goodbye. So there's really so much at stake. Um, and I think that the next question um, you touched on that um, it's, could you talk more about Donald Trump's father, Fred, and the lines that connect his racist business practices with the racism of his son's presidency? Sure. Well, Fred Trump was arrested in 1927 uh, during a pitched battle between a thousand KKK members in New York, some of whom were wearing hoods, many of whom were not, and New York City police. Now, Donald says that's all a lie, it's untrue. Well, it was reported in every major newspaper in New York. They're online now in newspapers.com and other places. And it lists Fred Trump being arrested, his proper age, and his home address which you can look up independently in other records and see that's his address. So this is just a lie by Donald. Uh, when Fred started building housing with these government subsidized loans, the, the uh, thievery that ticked off President Eisenhower, who after all was the man who had to send all those young men to their deaths on the beaches in France, um, they uh, did not allow Puerto Ricans, other Latinx peoples, and Black people into most of the buildings. So in 1973, after the um, Martin Luther King Fair Housing Law had been passed, um, the federal government sent out matched couples. They had documentation and stuff that showed they had the same incomes and debts and everything else. And a Black couple would show up and want to rent an apartment. Oh, we don't have any apartments, sorry, but you might try this building. And that's where they had people who were Black. A white couple would show up and they'd say, oh, we have six wonderful apartments. Please come see them. And they kept records where they coded, you know, people who came were P for Puerto Rican, C for colored, uh, or no mark at all for being uh, white and acceptable. Um, Donald was fined by the New Jersey Casino Control Commission for removing black uh, Puerto Rican and Asian dealers and cocktail waitresses from the table of his uh, biggest domestic gambler, Bob Labuddy, whom I wrote about in my first book, mm -hmm. Temples of Chance. Um, he repeatedly engaged in, in uh, racist conduct and has been found in adjudicated proceedings to have done this. So many people insist Donald's not a racist. Uh, my goodness, what do you think of a man who refers to the people in Charlottesville as fine people who says the Mexican government is sending rapists and murderers who points out a supporter of his, only he doesn't know it, in the front row of one of his demonstrations and attacks him and tells people to beat him up because he's black. Or who says at another uh, demonstration, I think a uh, uh, campaign stop, I think this was in Sacramento, that's my black guy over there. Of course, Donald's a racist. And his father was like that um, Mary Trump, uh, Donald's niece, has talked extensively about this, and the many executives that uh, were around him and competitors. You know, when I was covering the casino business in the late 80s and early 90s for the Philadelphia Inquirer, they all, all talked about it, how, how blatantly racist Donald Trump was. Uh, Donald at one point discovered that the, um, one of his executives who handled money was Black, the uh, mm -hmm. chief money guy at one of his casinos. And he said, I don't want black guys handling my money. I want a short guy who wears a yarmulke. 
One, I think, of, of the points in the book that really resonated with me was when, you know, you talked about how the administration and Trump's racism was deeply damaging to the soul of America. And, you know, how did Trump's racist and hateful rhetoric damage the soul of America? And kind of how do we recover from that? Well, I suppose uh, in a perverse way, one of the benefits of Donald Trump is we now know that the advances from the civil rights movement were veneer in many places. They weren't real. And the people who kept using the phrase political correctness, uh, code for, I really want to be able to call people slurs. Uh, if I don't like their skin color, their religion, their gender, their orientation, uh, he's really pulled back uh, that veneer. And I don't know how we get ahead from that, except trying to have people connect more with people who are not like them. Um, yeah. I had the very good fortune of growing up in a household where my father came from New Orleans, where he was born in 1910 to California, because he couldn't stand the racism. And he pounded into my head and my brothers there, but for the grace of God, go you, you could have been born poor and black in the South. My wife was very active as the head of our community foundation in Rochester, Grew up in a household where her father was one of the premier desegregation lawyers in America for the losing side. Mm -hmm. And she has a very different upbringing and she has spent her whole life fighting against that. And so we see these in sort of different eyes from our ch childhoods, but we both of us talk a lot about and meet with people about, you have to get people to be around people who aren't like yourself. Yes. So you're never going to understand that people are people skin color, gender, sexual orientation, religious belief has absolutely nothing to do with character. And that's the other thing Donald's done that's very troubling. We have created a society of wealth porn for some long time now. It started, I would argue, about the time of the Reagan administration. How much money you have tells you nothing about character. That, when I grew up, right. was not the American dream. The American dream was to uh, be prosper enough that, you know, you had your own home, you could take care of your family, you had a car that started every morning, uh, and you lived a good life of caring about other people, loving other people, sacrificing for other people. It's not how many commas you have to after your name. To the Trumps, all that matters is money. That's an empty value. There is not one word in our constitution about riches or wealth. And if that becomes our standard, we're why we have America. Who's going to go to war and die for this country if it becomes necessary so rich people can have their money? Uh, who is going to do anything to sacrifice for that? That's not a value. Uh, honor, liberating the human spirit to see what we can achieve as a species, those are things that people will die for and will work for. But money, no, That's it's nice to have money. It's nice to be wealthy. I am very happy when people create wealth and Americans have become very good at doing that. But that's not the goal of life. That's just a side benefit. Well said. The next question is, can you comment on the recent news that Trump ignored texts from his close circle to take action during the Capitol insurrection on January 6th? Yeah, well, of course, Donald did, because he's the person behind the insurrection. Uh, when we get hearings in the spring from the House January 6th Select Committee, it's going to become very clear that this was not a spontaneous event. It was a clownish effort, no, no question about that. But this didn't just pop up out of nowhere. Donald and his people were uh, raising money for this, directing people, sending signals, and they were behind it. And, and the two best proofs of that are when the Capitol is under siege, mm -hmm. did the Secret Service pick Donald up by his arms and take him to the Situation Room or put him on the helicopter and get him out of there? Of course not. He wasn't in any danger. He was in charge. And then we get these texts from members of Congress, uh, including apparently Jim Jordan, based on the newest reporting, and from Fox News hosts saying, you got to stop this, which tells you they understood perfectly well Donald Trump was behind this and he was in control and he could tell people to pull back. He's conspirator one here. So the next question is, I fear the next Republican president might be worse than Trump. 
what can we really do right now to prevent the next Trump from rising to power? And has America failed its heartland and their revenge in the election of Donald Trump? Yeah, whoever asked that, thank you very much. Um, Donald is not a competent manager. He's lazy. He doesn't have long-term strategic thinking. He acts in the moment. There are plenty of people out there who would have seen what Donald got away with, who've seen that we ran the presidency for through 44 presidents as an office of trust, and now that's broken. And they're looking at this and saying, whoa, if I could get into the White House, and some of them, I believe in their hearts, want to become our dictator because they hate America as it is. They want to have America be white dominated again. And if it isn't going to be, then they, they hate the country when the direction it's going. And I'm very, very worried about this if we don't get fundamental controls and reforms. So one of the things I call for in the book is we need to codify high crimes and misdemeanors mm -hmm. that and, and do it in a way that is not uh, uh, limited to that codification, but certain specific acts are defined to be high crimes and misdemeanors, and then we can retain the part that it's whatever Congress says it is. Um, we need to put serious limits on uh, business activities by presidents. Basically, they shouldn't be able to have an eyes wide open blind trust as Donald did. They shouldn't be able to operate any business whatsoever. And if they own business assets, they should be sold by someone who is picked not by the president, but by an independent panel to make sure that there's no uh, currying favor uh, with the president by paying uh, inappropriate prices, and it should be all transparent. If we don't do that, look at the uh, people like Josh Hawley, Tom Cotton, Rick DeSantis, uh, Senator Rick Scott, who was the head of a billion and a half dollar Medicaid fraud operation and somehow wasn't prosecuted, uh, Ted Cruz, and, and they and others. Uh, they'd be perfectly happy to step in and become our dictator. And, and our democracy is really at risk. And if we don't recognize that, in fact, I don't understand why people aren't, aren't you know, hair on fire out in the streets demanding serious action right now. I, th I think we're much too complacent. I couldn't agree more. Do you think that there's any appetite in Congress or from the people for some of these much needed reforms? No, because first of all, most people don't think about these sorts of things. You know, a lot of my career has been about governance. I, I've never, I've always covered Washington from afar and focused on, as we do at DC Report, government, what politicians do, not what they say. And come on, most people are not going to think about that stuff. Unfortunately, the institutions that represented ordinary people, the big mainstream church social justice movements, which at one time had a whole skyscraper in New York, or at least a pretty big building in New York, the labor union movement. Right. Uh, they've all been swept away. And all of this flows from something called the Powell Memo that Lewis Powell mm -hmm. wrote for the US Chamber of Commerce before he became a Supreme Court justice. And it's about how to bring the press to heel, how to get rid of the unions, how to make sure that America bows to the interests of business. And it's a brilliant memo. And it has uh, been very well implemented to weaken all of these institutions that speak up for ordinary people. So the, the only way to get that is uh, a, a movement led by someone who's charismatic like Donald and who says, we can do better. We can be a better place. I don't see anybody in the Democratic side who can do that. Uh, the, the Democrats, I've said repeatedly, uh, their messaging is, is just grossly incompetent. They can't sell ice cream to children in, on a hot July afternoon. Whereas the Republicans are masters of slogans and misleading slogans and, and reaching into your heart or your stomach, not you know, giving you a, oh, here's a 31 point memo and blah, 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 blah. And don't miss footnote number 182. Yeah, and to the candidates out there, I mean, hear that. I think that there are definitely improvements to democratic messaging that can be made in a way that really resonate with working in middle class Americans. So I think you know that that remains. Uh, there's just a lot of work in progress on that. Um, the last question I have are: Are there any new consequences currently in the works for Trump's crimes and behavior? And how is he still eligible to run for office? Well, he's still eligible because he's 40 years old and he's a natural born citizen. Um, 
Uh, Donald is facing uh, the grand jury in Manhattan, which I'm confident will indict him. They hired the number one expert on RICO law, Mark Pomerantz, as a special counsel, and he left his multi-million dollar a year legal practice to do this. He didn't do that to play games. Uh, Mimi Roca, veteran prosecutor with the Southern District of New York, the U.S. government's district, is now the district attorney of Westchester County, which is right next to New York City. She's investigating Donald for property tax fraud. Letitia James, the attorney general of New York, who only has inherent civil power, not criminal, has noticed Donald for a deposition. I don't think he'll ever have to testify in that, but she's made it clear she's going after him for uh, loan fraud, business record fraud, which is a big crime in New York State, and uh, property tax fraud. The district, the attorney general of the District of Columbia is investigating what happened with all that money for the inauguration. And there's a chapter in my book about how they literally wanted to take money from Russians and others off the books. That's a crime. And how that didn't happen and why. But maybe they did get money. They just didn't get it through the person they tried. Uh, and that's a story hardly anybody knows that's critical to understanding how corrupt these people are. Uh, and then in Fulton County, Georgia, which basically overlays the city of Atlanta, the district attorney is, uh, has a criminal investigation of Trump for vote fraud. And the legislature has been discussing how to prevent the DA from enforcing the cr existing criminal and election laws in that state to protect Trump. So he's got lots of problems out there. Plus, some of the civil suits are moving ahead. Uh, the courts have now basically adopted the position of Chief Justice Roberts in one of the Trump tax records cases. Uh, the uh, justice system is entitled to every man's evidence, and the president is not a king. If he's asked for evidence, he must produce it. So thank you uh, so much. That's our last question. Uh, but I wanted to thank David for this incredibly important and compelling discussion and for all of your work. And we are almost at the end of the program, but I wanted to leave you with one of David's final thoughts of the book. And that is a thank you to Trump for showing us how vulnerable our own democracy is to this kind of would-be dictator who only has his own interests at heart. And one of the best ways that you know, we can address this vulnerability is through active civic engagement, through participation, through reaching out to our neighbors. So thank you for engaging in this important and timely discussion. Um, and I'm gonna turn it over, good night. Well, thank you both so much. On behalf of Town Hall Seattle, I wanna thank you, David and Sarah for being with us tonight. David K. Johnson's new book, The Big Cheat, How Donald Trump Fleeced America and Enriched Himself and His Family is available at Third Place Books. There's a link in the chat to buy it directly from them. David and Sarah, thank you so much for being here. Thank you. Thank you.